next week called Food from Feast to Famine. And so it's going to be an amazing series. Probably, i got to be honest, the most excited I've ever been for a series we've done. Uh, as we just pray about what we're going to do uh, in the seasons ahead, uh, Bob, Ryan, and I were talking and praying, and we said, you know, we really feel like God is bringing us into a community emphasis this next season. We're throwing some ideas around and praying, and Bob says, let's just call it food. I said, Bob, let's call it food. I think it's a great idea. So we'll be breaking down a biblical history of what food is and the importance of it and the feasts and the symbolism. Uh, so it's going to be an exciting series. With that will be challenges in which we'll invite everybody to be a part of, of what the journey of hospitality looks like. Uh, Ryan and I got to meet with an Old Testament scholar this week, and it was just an incredible time of just really understanding what that first century mindset was and then really pre-millennia mindset uh, of their relation to the feasts and what food looked like and their dependency on God it was really an extraordinary thing. Uh, but that being said, as we were just discussing things with this uh, amazing scholar uh, and talking through these things with Cynthia, I, I just said, hey, I have to ask a couple questions that have been on my mind biblically. And one of them is Proverbs 31. I said, give me a perspective of what Proverbs 31 was in that Old Testament context. And this is what she says. She says, you know, I'm so glad you bring this up. The Western church has viewed it as a job description. But really, it was a celebration. And every Friday night, when they would celebrate Sabbath, they would read this. Her children rise up and call her happy. Her husband praises her. Many women have done excellently, excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And every Friday, they would remember the gift of that mom in the house. And when we talk about Mother's Day and the beauty of Mother's Day, and we know for many of us here, it's a, it's a time of celebration. It can also be a place of pain. It can be a place of difficulty. And we know that there's so many different experiences where when you come in here today and maybe you have a struggle with infertility, it doesn't negate your influence and impact on the body of Christ. That we are part of a family that needs spiritual moms and dads, and we all play a role in that. And we have to ask ourselves, is there somebody that's younger than me that I'm influencing? Guess what? You're probably becoming an aunt or an uncle. And as you get older, you'll become a mom and dad in their life. And that's the beauty of what the gospel looks like in our modern context. So we want to celebrate the moms today. Uh, my wife is a hero of mine. I love her so much. Uh, we survived strep throat this week in the house. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, two kids cleared, all of us came back uh, strep free, but it was an intense week of laundry in the house and uh, de germing our entire home. So uh, she's just a champ and a hero. And today uh, she's going to invite a panel of women that will be sharing their journey as moms. So would you welcome uh, Rachel and the rest of the team? Happy Mother's Day. While these beautiful ladies get settled, I just wanted to piggyback off of what Pastor Brandon and uh, Ryan had shared this morning about the, how tough it can be sometimes. And I know for the last couple of years, you know, I've been asked to share and I always want to start with just being real with us as a family and just praying over those who for today is actually like a thorn in their side because there are many people who are maybe they've just had a miscarriage there are many people who physically can't have children there are many people whose mums have passed away and today just feels really difficult and so as leaders in this house we just want to say we see you we're praying for you as we celebrate motherhood it is not just for those who have either adoptive or biological kids in their family we believe that a woman how they have been created before the dawn of time represents the mother heart of God. So everybody, every woman in this room is celebrated today. So I just wanted to let you know that from leadership. And I also wanted to pray over you. So Father, I just thank you for what you're going to do this morning. I thank you, Father, that the, you have handpicked the words that will be spoken today. You have handpicked every single person that's come into this room. And I thank you that there are things that you want to drop into their hearts this morning. 
And I thank you that you, first and foremost, see the quiet places, the places in us that don't dare to speak because of grief, because of fear of failure, because of loss and discouragement. And so, Father, I ask that as we share this morning, oh, that exhaustion would leave and that you would comfort and that every single person would leave this place with a little golden nugget from you in your name. Amen. We have six incredible mums of the house here this morning, but before we introduce them, one of the other mums of the house who's an incredible writer, may I add, sent me a piece uh, a couple of days ago. And Bran and I were reading it and we were like, you know what, this is going to be on the website and on social media and everything like that, but we feel like we would love you guys to hear it first. And so I'm going to read it. Um, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say who you are. I'm trying not to look at you. you give me a nod if that's it. Okay. It's Sarah Pruce, and she wrote this really from a place of being real and raw. So... The title is, What I Wish Someone Would Have Told Me in My First Years of Parenting. First five years of parenting. I'm going to preface this by saying, nobody asked me. My children aren't perfect, nor am I. And I have a lot to learn as a parent and human being. But there were a few things I spent way too much time on as a young and insecure mum that if I can help out even one mama, it was worth it. This was worth it. I remember being a young mom. I knew nothing. I wasn't maternal and ne never babysat. The nurses had to tell me to dress my first baby in the hospital. I was clueless. I read books and cry it out was all the rage. Babies only need to, be eat, uh, only need to eat every two hours, so I put them on a schedule. Quiet children, first-time obedient children, clean houses with quiet worship music on as you ate lunch at the kitchen table was what I was seeing modeled. So I dove in, feet first. I was going to fake it till I make it. And it worked with one child. <laughs> I remember having my second child, and she wouldn't nurse like my first. Fail. She never settled with cry it out, and I would sit outside her nursery crying along with her because it broke my heart. Fail. I wanted to be a good mum, and this was what society said a good mum did, so I complied for far too long. I hated constantly disciplining my kids, but I was so fearful of raising brats that that's what I did. Obey doesn't happen, discipline. Obey doesn't happen, discipline. That was an all-day cycle in my house. When my third baby came, I had just miscarried before, so really all the fear of being a good parent had broken off, and gratitude for getting to be a parent took over. I also realized with her, I didn't care what the book said, I was going with my heart. I honestly didn't care if my kids ate at the table, just put some food in your belly. I didn't care if they jumped off the furniture or ran in the house. That was other people's rules, society's rules, and they made my home into a place of constant discipline and not constant love. I started only enforcing rules I actually cared about. I picked my battles. My house became so much more peaceful and loud. Those can actually happen simultaneously, if you can believe it. I'm not even going to go into baby four. If you've seen my parenting style, you, it can only be described as don't die and use your manners. <laughs> it can also be described as if you let me sleep and feed the littles and put a show on them for, for them, you'll get a reward. If I happen to wake up to a clean house, you can basically have whatever you want in the entire world. I understand that my way is not the most people's way. I'm an extroverted feeler, so my kids being loud and active and always touching me and low amounts of scheduled things to do might drive some people crazy. It does my sister. All I'm saying is this. Figure out what is important to you, what you need in your home and space, what your kids need. And most of all, don't parent your kids so other people like them or to please people, there will always be criticism. Parent them so you like them. God gave them to you because you have what it takes to raise them into good humans. 
I can honestly say I like spending time with my kids. I highly doubt if they break a lamp, they will freak out and say, oh no, mom's going to kill us. But if they break someone's spirit, they might say that. And I'm okay with that. Sarah, can you stand up? We love you, Sarah. Thank you for sharing your wise words with us. All right, then. <clears throat> so we have six amazing women. I was going to start with Natalie, but she's Sarah's sister, and now she's lost it. So we're going we're to start with Sweet Nicole up on this end. Um, do you, can you pass the, the mic down this, this way? Um, so basically this morning, God was telling me he wanted you to hear from the mums of the house. He wants you to hear the real, the raw, the beautiful, the ugly, the messy, what it is to be a mum. And each of these six women have had incredible journeys and very different journeys. And God was very clear as to whom was supposed to be up here today. And so, Nicole, would you start by sharing a little about, bit about who you are, what's going on in your home as a mum, and uh, your journey? Um, so my name is Nicole. I have three daughters. They are six, five, and two. Um, my second daughter, actually I have two kids with special needs. Um, my second daughter in particular, it's, it's kind of hard to summarize what's going on in our life because we don't have a diagnosis. Um, we don't have an explanation for why we're kind of facing the challenges that we are. Uh, we've been through three rounds of genetic testing, MRIs, neurologists, I mean, you name it. But what, what it, the way it plays out for us is that she has low muscle tone over her entire body, which means there are gross motor skill delays, speech delays, fine motor. Um, you know, she kind of started walking when just before she turned three, started talking around that time frame as well. Um, and... Uh, I also have my third daughter who has similar delays, not as severe, but similar delays. And I guess the thing I would, the thing I would say is that it's been, it, I've learned that just having a kid with special needs is just a very different road to walk as a parent. I mean, we've got occupational therapy appointments, physical therapy appointments, speech therapy appointments, all these um, things. I think I, I kind of averaged it out to about an extra eight to 10 appointments per month, um, in addition to all the normal kids stuff, you know, because not only do you have all these therapy appointments, but you know, they're in special, uh, two of my kids are in specialized orthotics, so twice a year we're going to get those casted, and then we gotta go back to get them delivered and fitted, and you know, one of them wears glasses, and so in addition to all the school stuff and extracurricular and dental and normal things, you've got just this incredible um, impact on just the practical daily running of life with three small children. Um, and uh, I think something I hadn't realized uh, kind of when we started out in this whole journey, when we kind of started to realize that something was amiss with my daughter, something wasn't quite right, um, I, I hadn't realized kind of the toll it takes mentally and emotionally because, you know, when, you, when you're kind of with working with these challenges, it, there's this grief that hits you um, because you never quite, you, you grieve for your kid because you know that's always going to be hard for them. Um, but then, you know, you think, okay, my life's fine. We, we, we understand, like, this, these are our parameters. This is how we function. Maybe it's a little different, but, hey, this is what we do. We have to play in a specific way to work on these therapy goals, you know, um, hold her in a certain way or encourage her to step with a certain foot or just all these things that you just get used to integrating into your daily life and you don't think anything of it. And then every once in a while it just hits you. You know, my kid can't talk the way the rest of the kids do, and she's me mainstreaming into kindergarten. You know, what is that going to be like? What is it going to be like in two years' time? Is she going to catch up enough for them to not be horrible? Or is she going to be able to communicate in a meaningful way with her peers? Or, you know, I mean, at this point, there's she can't play team sports. She can't engage in a lot of playground stuff because of the, the physical coordination and strength and skills just aren't there. Um, 
And there were two big things, I think, that really impacted me um, kind of through this. Um, one of them was realizing, coming to the understanding that I was angry with God and I was really bitter with him because um, I kind of felt like I would do anything to fix this for her. I would do anything to, to her, for her not to be like this, to not have these challenges. Um, and for obviously for her sisters who, who aren't in the same boat to, to have this be a, a, such a big impacting part of their life. And I would do anything, but I can't. And here's God who could do anything and won't. And I was really upset that I'm like, why aren't you advocating for her? Why aren't you doing something? Um, and I hadn't even realized I was in that place until I, it was something here at church. And I uh, was praying through it with somebody here and um, just really just kind of processed through that and just came to God and said, wow, I'm really sorry. I didn't even realize I was putting that on you. And just, and, and the whole, just the goodness of God and just understanding, like, it's okay because he is good, just took on a whole new meaning for me. And it was revolutionary. And then the other thing was um, just realizing that I wasn't alone because I had reached out on Facebook with a very specific question about special needs and non-special needs siblings with regards to school. And I had so many people respond to me who I either had forgotten had special needs kids or didn't realize it. Um, and through a series of conversations, just realizing that I wasn't alone was huge. And um, because as, as a parent with um, kids with special needs, we have very supportive friends and family. We have very, I mean, just, in the trenches with us. But at the end of the day, they go back to their own life. It's not their kid, it's not their life. And so to connect with someone who got it, who understood, and I, it didn't matter like what kind, we're talking, you know, autistic, uh, sensory processing, Down syndrome, just whatever it was, deafness, I talked to a lot of people and it just, there's this common thread of, of, of understanding. And it was so key. To, to, to getting that in. That's beautiful. Thank you, Nicole. You know, when I, I mean, I've known Nicole for a long time now, and when I know, uh, when I've watched her journey, I just want to accolade you, Nicole, because you, she's very level-headed. I don't know if you can pick that up just from the few minutes she shared, but she's very level-headed. She's not over-emotional. So when she shares deeply like this, it hits me deep because I realize, like, she's, she's not a whiner. She gets things done. She's very organized. But I just want to say you have and will continue to do an incredible job. God has picked you specifically for the kids you have, and he's going to equip you and be with you through it all. And I believe that you're going to be a rock to many other people as people have been a rock to you in the community of people who have kids with special needs. So thank you for sharing. And also she's married to a Brit, so she's winning already. So <laughs> we go. Um, they met at my wedding. Anyway, um, over to v Vanessa. Why don't you fill us in with your story as a mom? Okay, so my, my name's Vanessa. I have three boys, uh, six, three, and one. Can we just clap her for having <laughs> three boys <laughs> before she shares anything else? Boy mom. Oh, yes. It's crazy all the time. Um, well, about, let's see, six, he's six, so yeah, six years ago, before I became a mom, I was a full-time working mom. Um, and I worked through his life for about two years. And I was raised by working parents. I was pretty much like raised by my grandma because they were always working. Um, so for me, in my mind, I was like, nope, I'm a working mom. And that's what I'm going to do. Um, but I didn't realize all the emotions that come when you have a baby. And you want to sit there and stare at them for hours and not do anything else. Um, and so it was, I went back to work between four and six weeks, um, went full time and had to leave my little baby behind. And gosh, um, just the ups and downs with all of that. If you're a working mom, you, 
there's so much guilt that comes with that um, because I remember getting videos and texts and things like that of Nehemiah doing his, you know, smiling and I hadn't seen him smile yet or sit up and I hadn't seen him smile yet. And I remember distinctly one day just going in my, and I am like a composed person, like I don't cry, you know, like <laughs> I used to not cry. Let's just say that. <laughs> used to. Um, but I just remember going to my bathroom at my work and just losing it and just thinking like that should be me that should be me holding him that should be me seeing his first steps that should be me seeing him sit for the first time all of those things but here I was at work and I knew that that was what I needed to do at the time um so then I had now I was pregnant with my second son and the Lord was prompting me to come home. Now, for the first year of my first son, I was like, I want to come home. I want to come home. Well, by this time, I had made, you know, the, the agreement that I'm good. I'm a working mom. This is my life. This is what I'm going to do. Um, and I, I love to work. Um, I just used to get, like, so much from that so, and realize so much of my identity came from that. Um, and my, how I got fed because all of the acknowledgement came from work. You know, I had a checklist. I could check things off. It was great. And people would say, good job. And the Lord was telling me to come home. And I, for six months said, no, (laughs) he was literally like, you're coming home. And I said, Lord, I know that you're saying to come home and I'm telling you, I am being disobedient and I'm saying no. So for six months, um, I just fought with him, and I had to work through all kinds of stuff, realizing that my identity didn't come from work, realizing that all these different stereotypes I had of stay-at-home, stay-at-home moms, um, because I was like, I don't want to wear sweatpants every day. <laughs> I actually like putting on makeup, you know, like, you know, the, just all these different things when the Lord's like, that's, that's not who you are. And you get to do staying at home the way that you do it. And that's going to look different. So it's okay if you have a schedule up on the whiteboard because you have a whiteboard in your home and that's who you are. (laughs) Um, It's okay that you do that. Like, you're going to figure it out and it's going to be your own. Um, And then I had to uh, just embrace that and whatever that would look like. So in the six years, I have been a full-time worker. I've been a full-time stay-at-home mom, and I've also been part-time working, part-time working out of the house, part-time working in the house. I mean, I literally have been through all kinds of working situations there is. Um, And I can say that every single one, the enemy will throw a certain type of guilt at you. At work, it's you're not there enough. At home, you're not doing enough because you constantly see everything around you. And I remember, like, trying to spend time, quality time with my boys and seeing the house become a mess. And I'm thinking, seriously, you have one job. (laughs) Like, maintain the home. And you can't even do that. So just hearing, like, the voice of the enemy so clear in even staying at home. Or a comparison. Oh, my gosh. Don't get... Don't get me started. <laughs> so, and then with part-time, it's you're failing at everything because you're balancing everything. You're like part-time here, part-time there. It's like you're, uh, I don't know a good word to say. You're like halfway doing it. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so you're like, you're not fully invested in one place. And so then you feel like you're dropping it somewhere. And so there has, it has been such a crazy journey, but I am so thankful that I have a husband who provides in a way that has literally said, do what you want. And so I work with him. So he's my boss. <laughs> and uh, so right now I work two days a week. So I still get to make a checklist and check it off. It's beautiful. And I get to spend, you know, what is that? Five days, five, four. <laughs> There's seven days in a week. Um, okay. No, five. Yay. I got it. <laughs> I know. Oh, man. I'm seeing like seven minus two equals. Okay. 
So I get to spend five days with them, and I get to invest in them, and I, I get to really invest in my three-year-old when it's key right now where I get a, I'm starting to see behaviors of, you know, the the three-year-old behaviors, and now I'm at least around to say, hey, babe, that's not what we do. We do it like this. Um, and so that has been so wonderful. So that is my story. Thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> do you know it was... It was really important um, a, couple, a few years ago. Well, actually, it was probably about, oh, now it's about eight years ago. When I, when I, back then, when I was on Facebook, there was this big debate going around about working mums versus stay-at-home mums. And I remember thinking, this, this comparison has to stop. This value, this judgment, we've got to like support each other in what we choose to do and not judge and not say one's better than the other, but really lift each other up as women who work and lift each other up as women who work in the home and, be, and have that bridge of unity. And what's so beautiful about the women's community here at The Rock is there, there really is not drama and there really is not comparison because we are all wanting the best for each other and we are all seeing each other as individuals and we're all um, underneath each other pushing each other up and accolading where they're at and I love that Vanessa has been really um, forefront in that and um, and actually and living it out on both sides of of the journey so thanks Vanessa we got the mama in the house Patty I love Patty <laughs> Hey. Yeah, let's give it up to Patty. Hey. Patty's old school rock. Patty's been here from the beginning. And she, I, I, when I called her up about today, um, I said, you know what, Patty, it's really, really valuable for us to have mums like you in the house, women like you in the house. And so I just want to say to you, Patty, and you already know this, I adore you, I respect you, um, and, I, and I think you, you represent people who are out in the congregation now that this... It counts for everyone here that um, is of an older age, that has a more maturity, that has done more and has experienced more, that we can sit at your feet and we can say, hey, what are we doing wrong? Or how are we doing this right? Can you help us through this? And so, um, Patty, we love you. Thank you for being in our life, both in the community at The Rock and also uh, beyond for many people. Thank you. Um, I wanted to um, just look at all of you and say, you know, we have one thing in common. We're not all Mexican. We're not, you know, well, we are. Yeah. <laughs> but we all have a mom. We all have a mom. So if, if you don't believe that God has a mothering heart, hmm, chew on that one. Um, so M Nicole has a five-year-old. Her five-year-old is my 25-year-old. Um, I come from a super athletic family um, from L.A., and most of those siblings still run half marathons, and they're, they're 65 years old, 66 years old, 67, and they still run half marathons. So super athletic. There were no disabilities in my family line. I looked because I thought, I got somebody else's card. This is not supposed to be my life. When my son was born 10 weeks early at 30 weeks and weighed less than three pounds and spent seven weeks in um, neonatal intensive care. And we didn't even know if he was gonna make it. And um, my husband and I got so familiar with walking down that hallway, we thought no one should be familiar with walking this hallway every day for seven weeks. And um, we were going to make sure that if there was anyone in our life in the future that had that issue, we were going to walk it with them. And we did. We missed some anniversary trips, some birthdays of ours, because we were walking with our friends who had similar lives that we didn't want them to be alone because we were kind of alone in that. So um, our son is now 25, but... Um, it was about, he was eight months old when I took him for a well baby checkup, and I, I didn't know what to expect. First kid, I wanted a bunch of kids. I was gonna have my own track team, my own <laughs> basketball team, my own softball team, and we were all gonna be really good, because I was really good. <laughs> but you don't, you don't get to control. You don't get to control. You don't get to decide what kind of kids you're gonna get. 
ye don't get to. So um, making peace with that is huge. It, it's huge. You just got to do it. Um, so eight months, my pediatrician says, have you ever thought about cerebral palsy? I'm like, excuse me, what does that even mean? I didn't have a clue. So off we go to starting the appointments like Nicole. And I worked graveyard 3 a.m. to 8 a.m. so that I could go to all those appointments. And I even drove in the snow because we lived in Kansas City. I'm from L.A. We don't do snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I landed on a few curbs. Anyway, um, so, um, but... In all of it, at, at that eight-month-old appointment, and I bawled my eyes out, what are we going to do? This is not my life. And my family didn't really know how to help me because they never had been there. Um, so I happened to be going to a conference that night. John R. Knott, some of you will remember the Toronto outpouring. So John R. Knott was coming to Pasadena, and I was going to be there. So I went up front for a prayer, and I'm just standing there bawling my eyes out because my little boy is is not going to be like I, I thought he could be and wanted him to be. And um, these uh, this friend had called a couple over 60. I'm 34 at the time. A little couple over 60, they come to pray for me. I don't know who they are. I open my eyes to look at them, and then I close my eyes. And um, as they're praying for me, the um, husband whispers in my ear. No, the, I'm sorry, the wife she says, I see the Lord holding a baby in his arms, and he's coming to you, and he's asking you, will you take care of this one for me? Okay, so, yeah, I bawled, fell on the floor, um, and, but it did something in me because all I could say was, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Whatever you want, Lord, I'll do this. <laughs> you got to help me, though, because I don't know what I'm doing. So, But there was a, a, a word from the Lord that they didn't know. Those people didn't know anything. The Lord made it so clear that this was his sovereign allowance that I would raise this one. Now, if you know my 25-year-old, um, he walks with a limp. We discovered later on that he had a stroke in utero, and one in 4,000 American children have a stroke in utero. That, yeah, that's the statistic I actually just recently found out. So um, we didn't know why he had a stroke, you know, there's, but I call it a sovereign allowance, but it just makes room for God to heal, and God's going to heal, and we believe God's going to heal him. Um, he's in pain every day. You heard my other part of my story. He's in pain every day, but he is all there if you talk to him. And he knows what's in his heart. He knows who he is. And um, at one stage of the game, the Lord, I said, Lord, how am I going to teach him the truth when all of America says something's wrong with you? What, how am I going to do that? And the Lord said, you download the truth to him and I'll persuade him. Okay, Holy Spirit, I can do that. I, I got a lot of scripture in here. I can do that <laughs> if you persuade him. And, and my son, Cart, funny thing, his name Carlton, it's a British name, and it means farmer. And the Lord said, he's going to farm and cultivate your backbone. Okay. Okay. I'll let him cultivate my backbone. And he has. He has. I got backbone, and not just because I'm a Mexican, tough kid, but I have a backbone that I didn't know I'd ever have, really, because of stuff. So um, that's my journey, and I've done tons like Nicole, tons of stuff to make him better, to help him be better, and the biggest part has been he knows who he is on the inside, and he knows who God is for him, and he doesn't walk around with less than emotionally, spiritually, he does physically, but not emotionally and spiritually. Yeah. 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 Um, my name's Christina, and uh, my husband and I, early in our marriage, felt called to adopt. And we're both um, firstborn, organized, uh, you know, driven people. So we're like, well 
foster care is pretty messy. Let's not do that. Um, and so we were like, oh, international, great. We felt called to it. Um, we definitely wanted a baby because we want them to be with us from the get-go and really learn our family culture. And um, we only wanted one at a time because two at a time would be way too hard. And um, we also you know, didn't want them having to go back to their birth family because that would be too hard. Um, and so we had a lot of these criteria healthy because you know, we don't have to go to therapy appointments. That would be too hard. Um, so, yeah, we ended up, uh, Ethiopia closed to international adoption. That was the country we were, um, going through after all of our paperwork and waiting, uh, for several years. And, um, so we ended up in foster care <laughs> and we, um, I have two biological children, a six-year-old and a three-year-old, and we now have brothers who were not babies, who have lots of therapy appointments and may eventually go back to their birth mom. And so, um... But God has really showed us that it's not our plan. We were fine with him writing like that, or at least I was, with the intro paragraph. And then I was like, I'll just finish the chapter because I have a lot of great ideas about what our family <laughs> can look like. And, you know, I'll make like a nice, cute, adoptive family. It's going to be perfect. All our kids will be well-behaved, obviously. Because, like, that's not going to be a good witness if my kids are throwing tantrums and, like, running through the street. Um, and... But God has really shown, like Patty said, like it's not about us controlling the outcome. It's about us following what he has put on our lives. We knew we were supposed to invest in orphans, invest in children, um, and he's going to write the rest of the script. And um, the second piece that was really big for us is um, the birth family aspect. Um, I, It's very hard to love birth parents that have caused the situation that your kids are in. Um, our kids came definitely with trauma, a lot of um, uh, just delays emotionally, physically. Um, and so it's hard to love the people that you perceive put them in this position. Um, but one day I was praying on the way to a birth mom visit and God said, I want you to hug her every birth mom visit and I want you to love her like she's your sister. And I was like, oh, I can't do that, God. I really can't do that. Um, but he has grown us so much. And we now text back and forth. And she has texted back and said, you and Josh are the only people who have ever been in my corner. Um, and we knew that God was asking us to love her and treat her with respect and um, fight for her and encourage her to succeed even if her victory meant getting the boys back, and that would be our greatest loss. Because um, we will have had them for a year, and they may go back to her, but we knew that that was what we were called to do. And um, so we have just, we've really loved her, and um, we just know that, you know, God will write the script, and even if it's not, you know, thank you, them being with us forever, like, you know, we had in mind, that that's okay. Um and there are other children maybe that are supposed to be in our home. But, um, and we also like feel that I had this perception that our fa in order to be a witness to our neighbors and advocate for foster kids, I had to have this perfect foster family where nobody had meltdowns and nobody was crazy. Um, and, you know, we have four kids, like meltdowns are always happening. I have two or twins now, not by birth. Um, so there's like the twin shenanigans and my neighbors, and we've had more conversations with our neighbors about Jesus and God and how we were called to this. I think because of that, because they're like having to come help grab one children from, you know, getting hit by a car or whatever, like they're help, they're helping us. And it really, it takes a village. And I think if we were so perfect and put together, then nobody would have to help us and we would have no opportunity um, to share Jesus. My name is <clears throat> Judy. I have four children, two boys and two girls between and we the call ages her the boss lady. of 38 and 48. Was I was just saying that we call you the boss lady because you've done it all. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it never stops. Once a parent, always a parent. <laughs> and I, it gets easier in some ways, yes, but in some ways it's hard. For me, one of the hardest times was the very beginning I lived in a little fantasy world 
Um, and I, when I got pregnant, I was so excited. We'd been married a couple of years, so I felt it was time. And so I had this picture of a baby, beautiful baby, cut out of a magazine. I had a picture framed, <laughs> hanging on the wall of my living room, and I'd sit and gaze and imagine what it would be like. And um, so it was quite a shock when, um, in the first place, my labor and delivery was not entirely natural like my girlfriends, whom I was trying desperately to keep up with. So the comparison issue was always huge for me. Perfectionistic and wanting everything to be just so, as many of us have expressed here today. And so um, it was it was really rough. Um, not so much, I mean, I got through the labor and delivery, but it was after that that um, I was having constant meltdowns. I was so resentful having to get up in the middle of the night to feed my baby. I needed my sleep. And um, I had this um, idea of nursing a child that would just be this wonderful thing. And the reality is it was very painful. I didn't really know how to do it, you know. How many, in my day, women didn't nurse their babies. They were bottle fed, and it was a new thing to breastfeed your child. And so it seems strange now. So anyway, um, I barely made it through the six week, first six weeks. I think I had postpartum depression, but in those days, you know, they didn't recognize that. My doctor later said, I was really worried about you when you came in at six weeks. <laughs> but he didn't do anything. Fortunately, I had... <laughs> Fortunately, I had my wonderful husband, Fred, who, as many of you know, calm, peaceful, you know. He would walk the baby by the hour. I had a wonderful baby, too, by the way. My first child, I mean, God was so good and so merciful. Um, she was really actually pretty easy. But anyway, as I said, I was, I had a lot of anger. I was very unhealed. <laughs> I was a new Christian, you know, and I hadn't had time to, you know, be um, helped. <laughs> um, anyway, I remember throwing the bottle. I finally had to resort to bottle feeding, which was totally just, you know, I just felt horrible, horrible failure, hor horrible. Because my girlfriends, they were nursing successfully. There again, the comparison. So I remember taking that bottle and just <laughs> throwing it against the wall one night. And <laughs> God, take me. I want to die. <laughs> this is just too hard. <laughs> But anyway, I did survive and went on to have four children. <laughs> you know that was the grace of God. <laughs> and Fred's prayers. <laughs> and I remember many of my friends coming to me later and saying, Judy, I can't believe you have four children. Because they, <laughs> they knew what I had gone through. And um, I just want to interject here. Sarah, that was just so precious what you shared. And... Um, I totally relate. Fred and I were actually, we never did change. We were hardcore parents all the way through. <laughs> and I blame myself. You know, looking back has been really hard. In fact, I would say as equally difficult as those early years were, um, and I did enjoy parenting very much. I came to love playing with my children. It was, um, I just loved playing with them when the housework was done. So... <laughs> <laughs> First things first, <laughs> and um, very, you know, very organized. Everything was always under control in our house until we had our third child, who was our first boy. And I used to think I could write a book on parenting when I only had two girls. Well, <laughs> along came the third, and <laughs> anyway, we didn't control him very well, but we sure tried. And amazingly, by the grace of God, all four of our children still speak to us today. <laughs> and they all are believers in Jesus Christ. And that, of course, yeah. I, one of the key things was asking forgiveness of my children. And the fact is, we did change. We did become more loving and more nurturing as time went on and I thank God for the grace you know that he gave us to make those changes but then the next hardest time and actually even harder was letting go because I was unhealthy in many ways um, had a lot of um, what was the word um, 
what do they call that, codependency type things. You know, I, I really didn't know how to draw on the Lord like I do now. I didn't really understand the depths of his love and his desire to satisfy everything within me. I didn't have that kind of relationship um, with the Holy Spirit that I do now. And so um, I really leaned on my children to satisfy me, which seems so strange because it was so hard. You know, I didn't even bond with my first child. It took months for me to really bond. I had no maternal feelings at all. And, um, but then they became so enjoyable in so many ways. And especially with my youngest son, he was um, a lot like me in his personality. And I got to homeschool him. And it was just a very uh, wonderful experience. And I had a really hard time letting them all go, but especially him. And so um, having, has, I had so many expectations for my children and myself, as we all do. So letting go and just letting them make their own choices and decisions as adults and not butting in, which I did. And Fred was always like, you know, Judy, maybe you shouldn't say that well. Judy did anyway, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I managed to um, especially alienate my sons. Um, they don't want mama telling them how to live their lives once they're grown up. So, you know, it's been a journey of constantly allowing the Lord to search my heart, to expose the things in me that are not in alignment with what he would want. And um, just being willing to be changed, be willing to surrender and let go of expectations, let go of the anger that comes with the disappointments. And um, God is helping me. Um, I can be quiet now with my children and let them just say what they want to say and, um, or do what they want to do, even though they don't handle their finances like I do. <laughs> <laughs> their children are wild and crazy, and they let their kids be kids, which is something that was so hard for Fred and I. And um, they have wonderful, raucous households, as Sarah, you described yours. And, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful, and I know that God is always working. He never stops, you know, and um, being a parent, always a parent. So thank you. Hi, I'm Natalie Faria, and I have three kids, a four-year-old boy, a 10-year-old girl, and an 18-year-old boy. I could probably sit here for hours talking about what each of my kids has taught me as a parent, but I'm going to focus on my firstborn, the one who made me a mom. When I got pregnant, I was 21, and growing up, I always had this ideal that I was going to get married by 22 and have my first child and live happily ever after. And after watching my parents go through a terrible, terrible divorce, that really shattered my whole ideal of, of what it meant to be in a relationship. And um, I got pregnant, not married. And I thought, okay, well, I just did it backwards. We'll get married now, and everything will be fine. But the man that I chose to have a baby with did not have that idea. And by the time I was halfway through my pregnancy, I was single. And I stayed that way until I met my husband, who is an amazing, amazing father. Um, I had an ideal also of what my labor and delivery would look like and all of that stuff. And, of course, I didn't know Jesus at the time, but he was already messing with me. Uh, everything that I thought was thrown out the window. I ended up having an emergency C-section in a hospital that I was not planning on being on, in. And at the time, my parents were still kind of reeling from their divorce. They were both dealing with their own stuff. And my sister, who, if you know me, you know that she's my person, but she was a senior in high school. So she was off doing her own stuff, and I was basically alone. I remember sitting in the hospital... Um, just like, okay, so I'm going to do this. And being berated by the nurses because my baby wouldn't latch and I didn't know what I was doing. Or because I had had a C-section and I couldn't get out of bed, I would change his diaper and he would pee all over the place and they'd have to come in and change my, my sheets and they'd be frustrated. And I thought, okay, I don't know how I'm going to do this. But he was a really good baby. He had an amazing temperament. He slept well. He ate well. Um, and everything was okay. 
until about 15 months old when literally overnight a switch had been flipped and all of a sudden I had this child that I did not recognize. He was angry. Um, he would get easily frustrated. He would lash out. Um, all of a sudden his behavior had gone down the tubes and I had no idea what was happening. So of course, I think, okay, well obviously this is something that I'm doing so I need to learn better discipline. So we did everything under the sun. I tried spanking him, I tried timeouts, I tried reward systems, I tried logical consequences and nothing was helping. I had people pulling me aside from my family, from the church, from everywhere telling me, you need to do a better job of disciplining your child. And I said, help me, I don't know what I'm doing. But nobody had an answer for me. So we're kind of just white knuckling it through life and I'm doing the best I can to, you know, basically at this point I'm, manage, I'm managing him. I'm learning his behaviors and I'm learning how he responds to the outside world and I am making a plan in my mind of what I need to do to contain him. Because at this point I'm realizing that it doesn't matter what extreme emotion he has, it turns to anger. If he's overly happy, overly tired, surprised, scared, excited, it doesn't matter what the emotion is, he is angry. And now I'm having to figure out, do I grab him kicking and screaming and take him out of a situation? Do I just kind of smile and you know say sorry and, and deal with it? It was really hard. When he started kindergarten, <laughs> That was a whole new aspect of life that we had to deal with where I was now getting phone calls from his teacher because he wasn't sitting in class. He was wandering around. He was disruptful and he was shouting out and he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. I was getting phone calls from the principal because he was lashing out at kids and the teachers. And so this is where my journey started of meeting with teachers, figuring out plans, trying to figure out how to make him successful. About halfway through kindergarten, he got sick and I ended up having to put him on some cold medication. And after that, he had three perfect days. And I thought, that's not right. That when he's on cold medication, he's having perfect days. So I took him to the doctor and he was promptly diagnosed with ADHD and put on medication. Which, you know, at that time I thought, that's what we'll do. We'll put him on medication, it will help him to, you know, have that extra focus that he needed, and it did. In class, he sat and he listened and he followed directions and he didn't talk. He still had anger, but we'll deal with that. So I noticed that all of a sudden my child was very compliant. He didn't really have any opinions. He did what I asked him to do. He wore what I asked him to wear. He listened to the music I asked him to listen to. He ate what I asked him to eat. He was still angry. He still had, you know, meltdowns, but at least he was compliant. At about eight years old, after a particularly hard day, I asked him, dude, what's the matter? And he said, mom, school is a hellhole, and I have to go every day. And that broke me inside. Like, I have to send my child to this place because it's the law. And I have to work full time, so I don't have the ability <laughs> to do other things with him. And I'm sending him somewhere where he feels like he's in hell every day. So Carrie and I decided after third grade that we were going to have an experiment. It was summer, and he didn't have to sit in class, and we were going to take him off the medication and see what happens. <laughs> so <laughs> we did, and, you know, he was crazy, but it was manageable because he didn't have to sit in class. But what I did notice was this. All of a sudden, he had an opinion. He started to dress a certain way. He told me what kind of music he wanted to listen to. He had suggestions about what we were going to eat for dinner. And all of a sudden, I realized that not only was I keeping him compliant in school, but I was muting who he was as a person. So we decided that wasn't going to happen again. And I, like I did when he started acting up, I went wholeheartedly into uh, research mode. What am I going to do to help my child so that he can not only be successful in school, but still be his own person? And we did diet, and we did oils, and we did holistic everything, and it worked. Within two weeks of us changing everything, his anger was gone. The time that I spent 
managing him and waiting for him to react, it didn't happen. And so it was awesome. But then puberty hit. (laughs) And he figured out that he could get food that he can't get at home at school. He was exposed to things that he shouldn't have been exposed to, and a lot of the anger and resentment and all of those things came back. And we were at a loss. And I was blaming myself because I didn't have the answers. And we literally white-knuckled it from that point until now. (laughs) And what I've learned is this. What the Lord taught me because I, I always prayed, Lord, heal his brain. You have the power to heal his brain. Why can't you just heal his brain? And the Lord finally said, stop it. Stop praying that. There's nothing wrong with his brain. I made his brain that way. I don't make mistakes. Just because the school system has failed him doesn't mean that something's wrong with him. And then the Lord very clearly gave me the plan and purpose that he had for his life. And I can tell you right now that the amount of peace that that gave me knowing there is nothing I can do except for what God has asked me to do. I can't tell you the freedom that I got from that. And I daily still lay him at the Lord's feet because Every single day there's a frustration and every single day I have to choose to fight. And that is what being Dylan's mom has taught me. It's taught me how to fight, not only against him, because I do often have to fight against him and his strong will, but to fight for him, to be an advocate for him, to know his strengths and his weaknesses, and to help him to be the most successful child he can be regardless of the situation that he's in, that is stacked against him no matter what he does. Because school will never be for a child with a brain like Dylan's. It's just not made that way. So how do I make him feel successful in a place that is just all-consumingly unsuccessful for him? And the answer is you love him through it. And that's what I have chosen to do, and actually in his card today that he wrote me. He's 18 now, so, you know, he thinks he's all big. But um, (laughs) he said, Mom, you have been a mom to me, and you have been a mom to many who didn't feel like they had a mom. And the reason that they felt that you were their mom is because you have done nothing but shown unconditional love. And for your child at 18 years old to tell you that the reason that he feels successful is because you loved him through it. I mean, that's like a kiss from God (laughs) because I'm still loving him through it. (laughs) Thank you, Natalie. Let's give all of these ladies a round of applause. It costs them something to come up here and share. It costs them something. So what we're going to do is we're going to dismiss so you can go and be with your kids and your families. But if something touched you, if what one of these ladies shared today touched you, they are going to be available down here um, to pray with you, to chat with you. There are many things in the women's community that we have available for you. You can go on the website. But to connect with these leaders is key. And so if there's something that just moved your heart, they're like, I'm not alone anymore, or I want to know more about that, please don't hesitate to come, and we would be so honored to pray with you.